thylacines were remarkably interesting animals, and an incredible example of convergence evolution. In this case with canids, and remain some of the most well-known recently extinct animals, and for good reason. Their extinction, an incredibly sad one at that, one of the most apparent cases of human paranoia and persecution, is well documented, with the last known documented thylacine dying in 1936, that's being the famous thylacine in the Hobart Zoo, who is often referred to as Benjamin. Their death on the 7th of September 1936 is the date now commemorated annually as Thurston Species Day, and helps to bring attention to not just the thylacine, but species all over the world and the plights they face. 1936 was the last time a thylacine was at least officially seen, and they were declared extinct 50 years later in 1986. However, numerous sightings and accounts with varying levels of credibility have been reported well after and into the present day. Which begs the question, when did thylacine, or as they are otherwise known, Tasmanian tigers, really become extinct? Thylacines has an incredibly large range, not just in Tasmania's east to west coast, but across Australia and Papua New Guinea from what we know. And as such, a potential late survival for them isn't entirely out of the realms of possibility, as will be discussed. Thylacine were known to have an historical known range across Tasmania from the east to west coast, with them being known to inhabit a range of environments, although preferring the island's coastal plains and scrub, although they could also be found more rarely in the heavily forested southern forests. Estimating their total population before the rapid extinction is difficult, although estimates anywhere from 2,000 to 4,000 individuals seems likely based on their estimated home ranges of a pair or individual to be around 50 to 60 square kilometres, and that they were likely to have been less rather than more. Two studies will be focused on in this video, one being published in 2016, and another currently undergoing peer review, thus if published, and its conclusions supported shows an extraordinary likelihood that they indeed persisted for a good while longer than was once thought. The first study, conducted by Stephen Sleitzholm and Cameron Campbell, comprehensively studied the extent of the thylacine's post-1900 range, basing their analysis on the retrospective analysis of 1,167 geo-referenced capture, kill and confirm sighting reports from 1900 to 1940, and then examining the probable cause of their population collapse and their survivability after 1936. Thylacines were both nocturnal and crepuscular, and as such, even in the early days of sessiment and throughout their time of being known to people, were already rarely seen, and due to little study of their ecology, little was and is known about their habits and what they were getting up to. Because of this, the capture, kill and sighting data, as mentioned earlier by non-scientists, largely bushmen, farmers and miscellaneous members of the public, form a very important and often underutilised source of information about their prevalence and form a distribution. The government bounties on thylacines ran from 1888 until its eventual termination in 1908, with many animals being killed off, the patterns of them and the locations where they occur as being relevant to go over. Over the 20 year period, previous estimates have stated that around 2,206 animals were killed, comprising 2,050 adults and 156 juveniles, with there being two distinct phases of capture, with the periods between 1900 and 1904 having bounty submissions of 617 with an annual mean of 123. The second phase, from 1905 and 1908, had a total number of bounty submissions of 230, with an annual mean of 46, a very big drop. This reduction of 63% indicates a sudden population collapse, although whether this directly correlates with the comparable reduction in the population as a whole is unknown. This sudden decline, which was very rapid and occurred state-wise, at about the same time, is not typical for a species that has been directly hunted to extinction, and it would be logical that if this wasn't the case, the animals would have disappeared first from the places where they had been most vigorously hunted, which did not take place. From the study, if hunting was indeed the only pressure, a viable population of no less than 632 animals could have survived well into the 20th century, as was determined, so another factor would have also been in play. Disease has been attributed to this drastic decline, with their low levels of genetic diversity, consistent with the founder effects, not helping in their ability to resist. The unknown disease, often cited at the time as distemper, or being distemper-like, decimated both thylacine and related animals, with it first appearing in the late 1890s around the far northeast of the island, and then taking five to six years to spread from the east to west coast populations. The disease stressed individuals, 
with affected thylacine exhibiting significant tail loss and or scabs over their head or body, and generally most little attempt to free themselves from snares once caught, and often died soon after due to the additional trauma. Their vulnerability to said disease, something common amongst island animals, sure seems to have had a major effect on their population, and does indeed appear to have been a significant factor in their extinction, something not helped by their hunting and habitat clearance, which was also noted by people at the time. Thylacine activity in the far south was less well documented than in other areas, in part because of the absence of human activity, something still maintained to this day, with the only real, somewhat frequent incursions being made by the occasional mineral prospectors. Thylacines were known to prefer the drier parts of the state, although they were indeed present in the western regions down south, although in likely low numbers. The authors concludes the paper by stating that a population of around 300 thylacine may well have survived to the end of the 1930s, in part because of logic dictating that such secretive animals, plus being nocturnal, could well have remained concealed amongst vast tracts of extremely dense vegetation, as well as within the fringes of their environment. Some experienced bushmen and hunters from the time also contended that they survived past their extinction dates from further observations, whether they be vocalisations, sightings or prints, and said accounts cannot just be casually dismissed because of this. This is made more significant in that a great deal of these searches were within the 1930-1939 to range, and their survival post-1936 is near certain because of this. The credibility of post-1936 sightings and reports is invariably questioned, and often disparaged, although their dismissal is odd considering other examples of critically endangered species being reported of within a few years of the species being last documented. David Flay, the man most well known for both filming and photographing many iconic shots of Benjamin at Bumara Zoo in 1933, set out in 1945 with the objective of securing a pair of thylacines for captive breeding at the Sir Colin Mackenzie Sanctuary in Victoria. His expedition, which continued through to 1946, according to him, found evidence that thylacine was still inhabiting the locality around the June River, with him hearing vocalisations and recording numerous footprints. While the expedition returned empty-handed, its proximity to the last known instance of thylacine living is worth taking into account with two bushmen also reportedly seeing a thylacine hunting a wallaby at close quarters between the Russell and Steenson valleys, and so, it's not unreasonable to assume that these animals were stragglers of a once more numerous population. Their survival does indeed become decidedly more contentious into the 1950s and onwards, but does warrant some brief mention, with a good deal of them being made by experienced naturalists and park rangers, people more unlikely to have made errors in identification. This has been further carried up by a 2021 preliminary study, still currently a preprint by Barry Brook and colleagues, which compiles many alleged sightings of thylacine throughout the 20th century, and from the results, lasted a good amount longer than has been thought. Compiling and analysing more than 1,200 sightings, and other records dating from 1910 to the present day, among the most credible was one made by Tasmanian Parks and Wildlife Officer Hans Narding at Togary in 1982, with him stating the following. While parked in a remote area of swamp forest, Narzin was asleep in his vehicle, although awoke at 2am, and switched on his torch to scan the surrounding area out of habits. Dark and heavily raining, he swept the beam around and came to rest on a large thylacine, which was standing side on some 6 to 7 metres away. His camera bag was out of immediate reach, so he decided instead to examine them carefully before risking any movement. He noticed that it was an adult male in apparently excellent condition, having 12 black stripes on a sandy coat. The animal only moved once, opening their jaw and showing off their teeth, presumably yawning. Narsing observed this apparent thylacine for a good three minutes, and did attempt to reach for his camera bag. However, in doing so, he disturbed the animal, and it moved away into the undergrowth. Narsing then left the vehicle, and moved to where the animal had disappeared, noticing a strong scent which is indeed known from them, but could not refind the animal. The encounter for the time was kept secret, as an intense search followed, but nothing was ever discovered, and the presumed thylacine had vanished just as quickly as they came. For this study, this is a key 4 to 5 out of 5 sighting, a rating assigned by Brooks from 1 to 5 on how likely he and his team thought said observation were to be true, taking into account how far away the animal was said to be seen, how long it was observed for, and the professional expertise of the witness or witnesses. If there was more than one, that also increased the score. Most of these reports are likely to be cases of mistaken identity, or even outright fabrications, although these were taken into account in the study's modelling. 
The records of a typical sighting by a member of the public are given about a 1% probability of being correct, whereas someone like a park ranger or before then, bushmen and trappers, would have a much better chance of guessing it right, and were given anywhere from a 25 to 50% probability. What was found was that thylacine could not only have persisted throughout the 20th century, there was indeed the probability of them surviving into the present, with a window of actual extinction more than likely occurring between the 1980s and the present day, either between the late 1990s and early 2000s, with the median estimated year of 1994, and a potential, if some chance, of persistence in the previously mentioned remote southwestern forest areas. Tasmania is a decent sized region at 64,000 km squares being roughly four-fifths the size of Ireland, twice the size of Belgium, and three times the size of Wales, although still possessing vast, largely uninhabited forested environments. As an additional reference, Yellowstone National Park, at nearly 9,000 km squared, is small in comparison to the total 40% of Tasmania that comprises protected reserves, which are three times bigger. Areas like Franklin Gould and Wild Rivers National Park are extremely inaccessible, and it is potentially plausible that some animals could be surviving there, although in very low numbers if they are. Brooks himself thinks the same, giving them about a 1 in 10 chance, although with camera traps being increasingly used, and groups such as the Thylacine Research Units being active, it's almost now or never for them, if some are indeed out there. So, could Thylacine have survived for longer than was thought? Well, that case is indeed a likely one, at least until more recently given the still great vastness of the Tasmanian wilderness, not to mention mainland Australia and New Guinea. Until more hard evidence comes about, however, whether that be through more recent remains or a confirmed sighting, a good chunk of this remains speculative and reliant on statistical inference, and for now, the thylacine remains enigmatic in its existence, whether they be today critically endangered, functionally extinct, or just plain extinct. All in all, I thank you for watching this video on these animals, and that you may have learned something new. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and with that, I'll see you next time whenever that's maybe.